Welcome to our October League of Women Voters Lunch and Learn. I am Lori Tro, and I am president of the Salina League of Women Voters. And our topic today is banned books. And today our speaker is Ben Johnson from the Salina Public Library. He is the Information Services Program Coordinator. So, Ben, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me come and do this presentation today. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and I know a lot of us here at the library as well. Uh, so any chance to talk about it and get people's eyes and ears on this important topic, I am all about it. Uh, so today I'm sort of going to be giving a breakdown. I can't cover um, the entire history of book banning, of the entire world in just an hour presentation. That just isn't possible, so I'm going to focus here on the states and sort of what we have been seeing here in recent years, as we've been seeing sort of an uptick, probably seen more news stories and heard more stories about it happening as of recently. So I'm going to give you the who, what, where, and why of intellectual freedom and how libraries, schools, and community members are continuing to fight for that today. So we're going to go through a little bit of history at first and then talk about who raises these book bans, who they affect, what materials are being targeted most frequently, where and when are they happening, why are they being uh, challenged or banned, and then what does the past year look like here in 2023? We often see a lot of data from past years, what are we seeing so far? So uh, we just had Banned Books Week last week, October 1st through 7th. It's sometimes in September. This year it was in October. Uh, Banned Books Week it was began in the 1980s, specifically 1982, as a way to combat a lot of the challenges they were receiving then. Uh, when we talk about uh, book banning in the U.S. on a larger scale, it's often thought that Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, was the first sort of widely banned books here in the state. The Confederacy censored it heavily due to abolitionist ideas, and we sort of look at this greater effect on why people are doing these book bans, and it often stems from larger issues that people take with. Uh, when Books Week, it celebrates the right for people to share and read ideas freely. That's known as intellectual freedom. Uh, while all ideas may not be as popular or everyone might not agree with those ideas, we try to keep an open mind and make sure that those ideas can be shared freely uh, without any sort of censorship. Uh, a lot of people take part in Banned Books Week. It's not just libraries, it's authors, publishers, teachers, and community members who come together and want to support this important initiative. One of the main uh, places that tracks and talks about banned books is the American Library Association. They have a specific office called the Office of Intellectual Freedom. They spend a lot of time gathering numbers and looking at data in regards to these bans and challenges across the U.S. Um, they also offer assistance to institutions who may be encountering an influx of challenges. So if a library or a school is receiving a lot of challenges and is just really not sure how to handle everything. It can be a very delicate thing to handle. They offer guidance and you can report those challenges and bans as they come in and they can offer assistance to different institutions in that way. They release statistics each year. We're going to take a look at a lot of those in this presentation. Uh, and show sort of what, on a larger scale, is happening in the world of book challenges. Another organization that we're going to look at some data from is PEN America. They are another organization that champions uh, intellectual freedom and the ability to spread ideas through literature. They track book bans in educational settings specifically, so a lot of the data we'll see from them is specifically school libraries. And they are actually currently involved in some litigation uh, down in Florida with a specific uh, school district due to the removal of around 200 books. 
So there are organizations out there that are trying to keep up with the fight and make sure that everyone has the ability to access books freely as they would like. So when we look at who uh, is raising these challenges, this is from the ALA uh, for 2022. Uh, as we can see here, a lot of it is parents, uh, whether that be in the schools or in public libraries, um, patrons, uh, again, for public libraries, and then it sort of breaks it down a little further from there to political and religious groups, board and administration, librarians and teachers, elected officials, and then uh, other, which is non-custodial relatives, non-residents, and community members without library cards. So they track a lot of different people and who, and sort of figure out why this group or why these people are bringing so many challenges and keeping track of that. When we talk about who is being affected by book bans, uh, I think this quote from Deborah Caldwell Stone, the director of the ALA Office for Intellectual Freedom, puts it quite succinctly, this is a dangerous time for readers and the public servants who provide access to reading materials. Readers, particularly students, are losing access to critical information, and libraries and teachers are under attack for doing their jobs. The part of that that stood out most for me is particularly students. Students are losing the chance at specific books because they are being challenged or removed due to different areas of their content for various different reasons. While it's important for everybody to pick what they want to read, everybody should have the freedom to pick what they want, and uh, I think removing materials simply just takes that away from other students who may want or need that book in order to figure something out. This one is from PEN America. This is the total number of authors, illustrators, and translators impacted by book bans in the 22 to 23 school year. While some authors may look at their book being challenged for bans as, oh, okay, this might bring some publicity, it might sell some copies, it also can bring a lot of negative attention uh, with the advent of the internet and anybody able to send a message to just about anybody they want. Uh, these creators of literature and artwork for those books uh, can often receive a lot of negative attention and that can be really hard to deal with when all you wanted to do was write a book and make it available for anybody. And just because a library somewhere else in the United States bought your book and now somebody's unhappy about that, you're receiving quite a bit of negative press. It can happen both ways and there can be ups and downs, but overall it's it's not good attention to get, usually. When we are looking at materials that are being targeted, obviously they are being targeted for a specific reason. When we look at this graphic here, uh, the materials that are being uh, challenged the most are books, graphic novels, and textbooks. But as you can see, it bleeds into other areas. It's not just books. It's displays and exhibits, programs, films, and then other things that libraries may offer. So it's not just included to books, it spreads throughout other materials as well. And we want those materials to be available, just like we want books to be available. And so I'm going to take you through the ALA compiles, a list of the most challenged books each year. These ones are from 2022. There are a couple of them that have tied, so you might see, I think you see number 10 about three times, that's because they had three books tied. Uh, number five also is a tie, so you won't see uh, six in there, it's just two number fives. Um, but uh, number 10, number number 10, number one, it is, uh, this book is gay by Juno Dawson, and then the next one is Me, Earl, and the Dying Girl. Crank by Ellen Hopkins, A Court of Mist and Fury by Sarah J. Moss, and you'll sort of want to look at this right here, which is the reason they were challenged or banned. Uh, we'll sort of look at those reasons in a second and what are the most pervasive and happen most frequently. 
by Out of the Darkness by Ashley Hope Perez. Absolute True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. You probably recognize this one. This one has been encountering challenges for quite some time. So we see books that are maintaining a status in people challenging or banning them. It doesn't happen just once. And then the book <coughs> fades sort of to obscurity. People remember and they will try to continue. Uh, Blonde Boy by Jonathan Evison. Looking for Alaska by John Green. Perks of Being a Wallflower by Stephen Chabosky. The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson. You might recognize that one. It was in the news uh, quite a bit in 2022 and 2023. And uh, Gender Queer by Maya Kobame. Flamer by Mike Kirito. I think my slide is out of order somewhere in there. But <laughs> <laughs> that one is number four. So <clears throat> I think something might have gotten out of order here, but we sort of took a look and we saw a lot of different reasons flash across that screen for both the challenges, challenged, but a um, majority of these uh, challenges are over books including LGBTQ content or books authored or including content about African Americans, people of color, and indigenous people. So those are the three main categories you see pop up a lot of these challenges. But I wanted to show this graph because uh, it's kind of shocking. You look at the number of challenges uh, and books, uh, unique titles that are challenged per year. We look about two decades ago, and we had 305, and we get up to 2022, and we saw an influx to 2,571 unique titles across the United States being challenged. So it's quite a jump. We saw it sort of started happening in 2021, and it's only continued to escalate since then. When we look at where these challenges take place, it is typically where you would think public libraries, schools, and uh, higher education facilities. The majority of them happen in schools and schools libraries. Uh, they're broken down into two different categories. So some books may be removed from a school's library, but be allowed to stay in a teacher's personal library. There are different levels of removal of a book from an institution. It depends on that institution's policies and procedures and how they go through things. And there's, of course, a way for that, you to do that with all schools and libraries. And they should have something ready for you. When we look at across the United States, uh, this is uh, specifically in schools for the 2022-2023 school year. As you can see, we have a lot of beige on there, uh, which is good, but that's one plus one to ten bands, uh, so we're not seeing a ton in some states. And then we're seeing some dark red in a couple of places, and that's unfortunate. We saw a lot of uh, book bans and challenges coming out of Texas and Florida this year. Uh, like we mentioned at the beginning, uh, Pan America is working down in Florida in a school district down there to do their removal of 200 books. So we're looking at uh, quite a lot of books being removed from different schools. And if the library doesn't have any books, that can make it a little tricky to run a library anywhere you're trying to get students information. Um, so obviously we would like to see uh, a lot more states uh, in this gray color. We'd love to see uh, that just about everywhere, but we've, we've got some work to do on spreading the message. I have a question. You look at that map, if I'm reading it right, Missouri has at least 300, uh, you know, in color, or 600, uh, whichever it might be. Yeah. Kansas, by comparison, is only one to ten. Am I reading that right? Yes, you are reading that. Correctly. It makes me that may well be, but it makes me wonder because 
I don't see Missouri and Kansas as that much different in political complexion. Do you know anything about the source of the, about that source? Um, I haven't taken a huge look at Missouri. I did pull up a couple of things for Kansas, um, but my assumption would be that there, there are different, uh, I'll, I'll talk about it also a little bit uh, in a second, but yeah. uh, with the ability of the internet to spread information so quickly to so many people, uh, there are a lot of groups that are getting together to uh, target institutions and almost dogpile them with so many complaints about books that they almost don't have time to do anything but start going through those complaints. And it may just be that there were more active groups that got through more challenges. It could be boards making decisions for libraries or school districts. It sort of just depends on what's going on with each individual institution. I, I don't know this for sure, but it could be that the uh, way that Missouri school districts are set up is more under the uh, control of the legislature. And in Kansas, we're pretty independent, and we have our own uh, policies for those kind of things. So it could be that they mm -hmm. set some uh, bands down from the legislature to the schools, but I don't really know that. Just a thought. Absolutely. Uh, the decisions come from all different levels depending <coughs> on where you're working from. Schools are going to operate different than public libraries in terms of where those decisions are handed down from, whether it be the district, whether it be a specific principal or administrator. It really just depends on the individual institution. I would be interested to look more into why that is and why we saw so many more in Missouri then even, even the surrounding states, we look at it not just Kansas, but we look at Colorado, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Arkansas. We are, we're only seeing one to ten bands there, and it could have just could have just been a bad year for Missouri. That's, that's what I can chop that up to. Uh, but I would be super interested to look more into specifically that. So we're finally back around to the why. Why do people challenge books? Um, a lot of it comes down to content or the authorship of that book, whether that author, uh, like we said, is a part of the LGBTQ community or is uh, a person of color. Uh, people have all sorts of different reasons for challenging books we see. The, this one is specifically from PEN America, and so it is, again, uh, for school libraries. 44% uh, of books that were uh, banned included themes or instances of violence, physical abuse. Uh, the next was 38% for topics on health and well-being for students. 30% for themes of grief and death. 30% for characters of color or themes of race and racism. 26% for LGBTQ characters or themes. 24% for sexual experiences between characters, and 17% for mentions of teen pregnancy, abortion, or sexual assault. So it really runs the gambit of reasons why people would target a book, and uh, when we look at those themes, uh, there's a little note up there. Many titles contain more than one type of content, so they're breaking it down as best they could, but a lot of these books may include two or three of those themes. Can you give me an example of a topic of health and well-being that would be objectionable? Um, sex education. That's oh, it's sex education. Um, okay. It could be related to self-care or like going through puberty, things like that. Puberty. Sorry, I suddenly lost my voice. It could be related to self-care for like going through puberty and things like that. Oh, um, yeah, we can help. <laughs> That's a story. Yeah, I, it really is just going to be up to those individual people and what they are not happy with um, in terms of what a certain book may have. They could run the gambit of options, but yeah, uh, most likely something along those lines of puberty or um, sexual wellness or sexual health in terms of making sure students can be safe while they do that, just providing those sort of resources. Uh, um, <coughs> 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 
Absolutely, that that could be a topic that somebody might raise uh, in that health and, health and well-being for students. It could also be uh, mental health. It could be it could run the gamut of things. This is a very similar looking graph. Um, this is. Uh, Sorry, this graph was specifically uh, for the lighter half of 2022. This graph is for uh, the school year 2022 to 2023, uh, July through June 2022 to 2023. And we see a lot of those same uh, topics being brought up again. We've almost condensed it here, but once again, the highest are the themes of violence and physical abuse. Uh, and we see a little bit higher uh, percentages for some of those as compared to the earlier part of 2022. So when we look at 2023, the ALA has released some preliminary data to sort of look at what all has been going on in the last year. So if we look these are from uh, January to August, these numbers. Uh, 695 attempts to ban or restrict library materials and services. Uh, 1,915 unique titles targeted for censorship. 3,923 total titles. 92% of the books that were challenged were part of attempts to censor multiple titles. What we're seeing is no longer uh, somebody with a concern for one book, bringing that uh, often lists of books are being disseminated to multiple people to bring those challenges. Uh, sometimes quite long lists, sometimes shorter ones. It depends on what people's goal are when they are finding those complaints. Uh, in terms of where they occurred, uh, we're seeing again that school districts uh, have 220 uh, censorships uh, happening and 208 public libraries. So this is still an issue that's affecting both institutions, but we're seeing a lot of it happening in school districts. There were more than 100 titles challenged in the states of Colorado, Connecticut, Florida, Idaho, Missouri, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Texas, and Virginia. So that's just this first eight months of 2023, and we're already seeing that the numbers are looking pretty similar to what we're seeing for past years and what we're looking at those other graphs. It's not backing down, it's con continuing to climb and be something that is affecting. A lot of, I did this presentation uh, once last year during Banned Books Week, um, and the question that I got at the end uh, a lot was, what is uh, the Salina Public Library's specific policy when it comes to fielding challenges uh, regarding books? And I neglected to have our, our policy up on the screen for people, but I'll sort of just give you the rundown of our policy here at the library. This can be found on our website in our policy section. Uh, we, the library recognizes its responsibility to make available a representative selection of materials on subjects of interest to its users, including materials that represent various sides of controversial questions. Patrons may request a review of materials by following established library procedure, which is as follows. Uh, patrons can, uh, cons that are concerned with the material can schedule a meeting to discuss their turn, their concerns with our head of information services, head of youth services, or the assistant director or library director. And they will make sure to get the policies out uh, to the person after discussion with one of those staff members, uh, if someone is still concerned about a material, they can complete a form uh, requesting that that other look be taken at that material. Upon that form being turned in, uh, the director and appropriate department head will review that material and a copy of the request will be provided to the library's board. And the decision of that review uh, will be provided to both the patron and the board. 
if someone is not satisfied uh, with the outcome of that form being turned in, you can request in writing to the library board that procedure be reviewed and be considered at an upcoming meeting. Uh, the board is limited to review of whether the library policies have been appropriately applied, and if a determination is made that policies have not been applied appropriately, further action can be taken. So that's our specific stance right now, our policies here at the library regarding that. So we do take it seriously, and we do have something set in place when these pop up here in our area. So it's the director and the department head that make the decision then? Yeah, at first, when that review is turned in, uh, it will be looked at. So if it's uh, a material upstairs, that would be with our information services department head. And if it's a material down here in the youth area, it would be the department head of youth along with uh, the directors. How many books have been banned, if any, in 22 and 23 at this library? At this library, we have not had any books that have been removed that I am aware of. We did encounter some challenges to specific materials, but I don't believe any of those materials were officially removed from the library. So what criteria do the uh, directors, the head of these departments, use in making their decision? Um, so. If you want me to address that. Yeah, I, I can't personally speak on that, but we do have our assistant director, Amy, here with us. And yeah, I'm assistant director Amy Adams. I'm also a lead member, so I'm playing two, two dual roles today. Um, so as part of the uh, process that we ask patrons to go through when they're challenging materials, we do have them identify uh, what they're objecting to in the materials. The um, Myself, the director and department heads, who then uh, read the material, uh, consider whether the items that they pointed out are, are um, valid and can then consider that in the context of the value of the material as, whole, as a whole. Mm -hmm. Is that, does you feel like that answers your question? Well, there, so there's no external definitions of what is valuable or something. So it's a judgment call. It is. It yeah. Is. Okay. Makes, it, makes sense. <clears throat> After looking at your data there, that 30% of parents initiated challenges, right? Yeah, and so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, 10 most challenged books mm -hmm. were mostly had because of sexual content? Yeah, so if we give a little, here, I'll go back to you. So do you kind of think that maybe there's a rise in these challenged books because parents are trying to protect their kids from reading sexually explicit materials that are available in the public schools and the public libraries? Um, yeah, that's a reason you see pop up a lot with these uh, book bans and challenges is it's generally coming, uh, I would say, from a place of parents wanting to protect their kids. You know, you want to be able to make sure your kids are reading uh, things that you find appropriate for them. And that is every parent's right to do so. What we are attempting to do here is not say that you cannot decide for your child or your family what's appropriate, but that you cannot decide for everyone what is necessarily appropriate for them to read. Uh, each person gets that individual choice, and if you take a material from somewhere like the library where a community may, member may be able to access that book if they aren't able to purchase it or access it somewhere else, you're taking away their ability to read that book and consider those ideas and take care of what they need to when they're looking at this book. Mm -hmm. it, um, Are there parameters in this library that protect, I mean, so parents can know what the kids are reading? That's your, yeah, oh. So, um, children, uh, children until they're 18, when they become adults, I have what we call a youth card, which gives them access to materials on this bottom floor. At age 11, they can get a full adult card with parental sign-off. 
um, uh, parents and guardians can also link their account so they can see um, everything that's checked out on the child's card. <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I'm like, back to you were before that question we were talking about that you had re we'd received some complaints mm -hmm. last year in this library, and I was just curious what the topic of the the reason, which which of the reasons for the complaints, right. so, was there just one or, or multiple ones? Um, so we have received one uh, challenge. And what can it, you say? Why it or? was for um, the same title that the school district has, oh, oh and, all of, uh, and for similar reasons, okay. sexual content in that um, title. What we see more often is people hiding books to prevent other people. <laughs> <laughs> Really? Yes. Yeah. Well, well, I appreciate Amy introducing herself, and I think that it would behoove all of us to be able to say who we are when we're addressing you and asking you a question. So my name's Janice Norlin, and um, I'm curious about the hierarchy of the public library. Are you under the city? Are you a separate identity? And then my second question is, we have heard it's probably, I hope it's an urban myth, but we've heard that maybe there aren't, haven't been as many challenges, but that some of the books have been, have gone missing from the shelves. Well, so I'll address the, I don't want to take over then. But, um, so under Kansas statute, we're what is referred to as a free public library, which means that we have our own taxing authority and we have our own governing board. The uh, mayor of the city does appoint members to that board, but otherwise our library board makes its own policies, uh, oversees the library director, uh, approves the budget, all of that. Um, and then as far as materials going missing, we're not, I mean we always have some lost materials here at the library, um, but we have not really assigned that to people trying to remove them from the collection. Uh, what we do see is people hiding materials, and I think that there has been some coordination um, or people tipping each other off as that being a thing to try out. So we do do extensive search for materials here to try to locate them and uh, reshelve them appropriately. So what you're saying is that there's been perhaps a concerted effort on a group of people to hide books? I mean, potentially, yes. Uh, we see certain titles and certain topics uh, And uh, like I said, with Facebook and email and everything, people are able to send out lists of books that perhaps they are trying to challenge and encourage others to go out and either challenge or go into the library and hide those materials. We haven't seen it by the time here, but it may be even just so far as checking those materials out and then not returning them because that keeps it out of the collection and out of other people's hands. We, like Amy said, we haven't seen anything that suggests there's a concerted effort to do that at this point, but other libraries uh, have seen that sort of behavior. So, so if someone checks out a book, they it return it. Of course, you have the names and the dates they're supposed to return it. How, how do you hold those people accountable, or do you, for, okay. for not returning the book? I mean, we have our fines system in place, sort of just as a an encouragement for people to turn things in on time. Uh, and then if a book does go missing or is not returned while in a patron's possession, uh, we do reserve the right to charge a patron for the replacement copy. Uh, if we plan to make a replacement copy of that material. Does that sound right, Amy? Yes, and once you get to, like once you have $5 of overdue fines, you can't check out anymore. So it disincentivizes you to not return so we do have some of those safeguards in place. Obviously, uh, we, we can't know if somebody has checked out a book specifically to make it go missing versus somebody threw it in the trunk of their car and forgot about it uh, with, by an accident. 
didn't mean to keep it out of the library's hands. It, that's a tricky one that we can't always see on the surface, but when a concerted group effort is made, then it becomes more identifiable. So on those 10 most challenged books, or those six titles in our case, um, in general, where are those holdings housed in this library? Um, that depends on the, each specific book. Um, some of these books are young adult titles. Some of them are considered adult titles. A lot of them you will see are young adult titles, especially if they're being challenged within schools or school districts. Those are going to mostly house uh, quite a bit of young adult literature, as that's the, uh, the age group they are catering to there. Uh, so you'll see a lot of YA on the list, uh, just because that's what these, that's what kids are picking up, and a lot of these efforts are in the name of protecting the kids from something you don't want them to read. Yeah. Well, I am Bonnie Shamber. I'm on the school board, and this book was challenged, and I have read that cover to cover, and. Uh, I don't, you can sit here and talk about it, but until you read it to know what's actually in it, that it, it's very concerning. Uh, it goes into detail how he was molested by his cousin. It also can, if somebody wants to read that, they'll learn how to molest their own little cousins. It also shares how he lost his virginity twice. Uh, it's very explicit, it's basic pornography, sexually explicit. Things. Um, it's, it, you know, he could have not had to put all the details in there of how painful it was and how to do oral sex and all of this, but it is, we can sit here and talk about challenged books, but we need to know what's in them and actually what, what they're doing and where, where, what's the motive for the book. He actually says he is an activist. He's not advocating for people. He's activist for gender, a queer, blacks, and CRT. He has that in on um, page 82 or 182. Uh, so he is an activist wanting people, kids, to follow what he is into, which, you know, I guess that's his right, but maybe that's why this book was challenged. It, some of the pages were read in um, a hearing at the Washington, D.C., uh, and the congressman said, this is pornography. It's obscene, sexual, explicit things in this book, and it was this book he was reading out of. So I don't know. There's a bigger picture here. I agree with you that, you know, books, you know, they should have a valid reason why they would be challenged. but looks like the whole problem is the sexual explicit content and why are so many authors writing so many books? Are they trying to change the this you know this generation that's coming up to view things totally different? You know? So I can you talk a little bit about why a library might might choose that as a title to be on the title. I mean, because what you've talked about is that it, it's seen in a context of its benefits. I mean, even difficult titles are seen in that context. Can you talk a little bit about what would maybe make a public library say this is a worthy holding to have? I can talk a little bit. I am not part of our uh, collection uh, selection and review committee, so I'm not in those meetings actively making uh, those decisions on what is uh, purchased and brought into the collection. Uh, to touch on uh, what you were talking about, I absolutely understand there being that concern uh, for what material might be in the book. Um, I would say that, yeah, the overall context of the book uh, needs to be looked at, um, given that this specific <coughs> title is a memoir, is nonfiction. Uh, different arguments could be made about different things being included as it's somebody's real experience. And while some may find it objectionable, this is something that happened. And, and an 11-year-old can check this out at this library? Or I hope so. I hope so. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
So I, I'm also on the school board and I also read the book. Um, my reading of it, did, he's not advocating to, for others to become what he is. He is saying that he is this way and that other people who are this way too should know when they're being abused. Uh, that's, and um, he had these things happen to him and he felt like he was the only one in the world who that happened to. And so this is one of the reasons he said he was putting it out there. Uh, and, and so uh, did. we did have a discussion of this, you know, and we did say it had value. I mean, and, but it did have really cringeworthy parts to it. So, uh, not, so does life. Not necessarily appropriate for an 11-year-old. If you are being, being abused as an 11 year old, it might be worth reading that so that you know that you shouldn't have to go through that or that it's not right. You know, that, that's the kind of lesson he was trying to say. These things happen and, and they shouldn't, you shouldn't expect to be abused and say it's okay. No, yeah. but he did say he was an activist. Oh, he is an activist, yeah. trying to make sure other kids <laughs> aren't feeling as alone as he is. He's not an advocate. He mm -hmm. declared himself as an activist, and there's two different things. Well, so there's nothing wrong with being an activist. No, Many of us are but, activists. You know, it was his wrong. story. It was his story. Right. It was. Anyway. Right. Can, can I say so that uh, I appreciate Bonnie's identifying herself in her role, uh, and I understand her perspective. Uh, I'm David Dorland. I'm Right. Janice, who made the suggestion we identify ourselves, <laughs> and it's probably a good suggestion. Um, I, I, not that I am especially well knowledgeable about this, but I've done some research and written about it, um, and uh, it's a knowledge that's publicly available. But um, the, the key question seems to be, and clearly is, at what age is the material, and in what situation, personally, is that material helpful or harmful for the person reading it, whether adult or child. And I think that's something we all have to wrestle with. Uh, I think it's legitimate to talk about. But I want to just personally comment that I did not read the autobiography of Malcolm X until I was a freshman in college. And it changed my life because it gave me insight into another world that I was not aware of. And that is the value of books, is that it expands our horizon and lets us see others experience and that is enriching and rewarding generally I was never I, I, I by the way didn't read all the book but I read part of it I wasn't great during that process I didn't engage in any activity that might have arisen or was depicted in that book but I think I can see where as a young person as is described in the book that could as was suggested here be valuable and one other thing I think is important in the conversation is that the, uh, the organization and structure of public libraries and how they're funded is very important here. In Kansas and St. Mary's, the city commission was voting and hasn't yet, as far as I know, to refuse to let the library board use their buildings. So that's their source of power. In Sterling, Kansas, the city commission pretty much has a lock on who gets appointed, and two librarians were summarily fired not because of the books, but because they had a rainbow display, not necessarily connected to gays, but they were very sensitive about that, and those librarians lost their jobs. So there are very real issues here, but I think what I would say is we all need to be careful about the attitudes that we have and the power that we hope to project to prevent harm or whatever are guided properly, not misguided. I guess I would finish all that up by saying everybody's going to read the same book and get something different out of it. The library is not trying to endorse any sort of behaviors or anything that you may read in any given book. It's up to you what you and yours are reading, and we just want to give everybody the opportunity, that same opportunity across the board. Could you just define unique titles for me? I didn't know. Uh, yes, so unique titles, that would be uh, just each specific title when it talks about uh, this book was a part of a larger effort to uh, challenge more books. Um, it may, uh, this, take for instance, uh, this book, 
that it was challenged here in Salina, it was challenged in other states. When it's tracking that data, uh, this counts as one unique title, oh. though it may have been challenged several more times. I think the saddest thing about this is that this happens to people. This happens to 11-year-olds. And I think it's very important, as Janet said about, or somebody said about not feeling alone and feeling like maybe there's something I should do or I could do about it. Um, so the sad and the horrible thing is this obscenity and sexual abuse and child abuse and guns and everything else that are harming our children, that's really happening in this world. And there's absolutely, in my mind, as David said, that's how we learn about the world. We all are white, probably middle-aged, middle over-middle-aged, over fairly wealthy people who have some knowledge of the world. But I think it helps everybody to read some YA book along the way, even as a 70-year-old woman. And I will recommend, recommend one right now. It's called For Lamb, and it's about the civil rights in Jackson, Mississippi in the 60s. I got it from upstairs and I appreciate it every day that I read that book. So that helps all of us get a better understanding and, and develop more understanding and compassion for all of our human travelers here. So I want to add one other thing. It's Somebody pointed out that that book could be checked out by an 11 year old, but I want to affirm with both of you that that would be an 11 year old whose parent signed off on them being able to yeah. check it out. Or not necessarily. It's, if it's in the youth services department, they have a youth card, they can check out anything. Okay. Uh, well, no, that's fine. The parent checks what they check out, they don't know. Right. But what we find is families come in here, but they will have their brought in to buy their parents. Yeah. yeah, but if a child come in from the library by himself and check it out and didn't tell mom and dad, mom and dad wouldn't know unless they got on to the, the account and looked to see what he got. Right? I, I have to just share a story. My son uh, at 11, well, he was probably 12 or 13, but he was uh, wanting to check out a book that he had to go upstairs to get. And so when we went to check it out, they said, uh, well, uh, you have to get an adult car because it was upstairs. And, uh, and I looked at my kid for a hot minute and I said, sure. You know, uh, I, I think the best thing that parents can often choose to do is simply talk with your kids about the books they're reading. Yes. Right? Create that culture. You know? uh, and we did. That's what we did. I don't know. I have to look at our bottom. I just want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank Ben for presenting to us today. And to remind you of a couple events coming up. Our next event is Sunday, October 15th from 3 to 5 at Sunrise Presbyterian Church. We are having speed dating with the candidates. It's our um, candidate forum for the November election. And then our next Lunch and Learn will be Tuesday, November the 14th, and Jane Anderson with Friends of the River will be presenting an update on the River Project. So again, thank you for coming in. If you haven't signed in to let us know you were here, please do so before you leave. Thank you.